everyone. This is Anna Hicks with Spivey Consulting Group, and I'm here today with Mike Spivey to talk about bad admissions advice online. Mike, I've heard you mention several times that you founded Spivey Consulting Group because you were sick of reading bad admissions advice. Can you talk a little bit more about your line of thinking at that time and some of the bad advice you were responding to? Sure. It, and that's not the only reason I founded Spivey Consulting, but it was a growing frustration of mine. I mean, I think what applicants tend to lose sight of because they're, they're not in sight is how often people in law schools, particularly people in admissions, are on message boards. And it's not they're not on message boards to figure out who you are unless you, you start acting aggressive against them. We actually have a podcast about that that I can link in the description of this about the being on message boards. <laughs> yeah, okay, do, please, because there, there are uh, certainly deleterious things you can do on message boards, and th- that's a good podcast for people to, to hear. I, for- I forgot we did that one. But they're mostly on message boards and online because they're Googling the name of their school because they want to know how their brand is coming across relative to how they want their brand to come across. You know, what people are saying about you online when you're at law school, free information that helps you with your messaging. So I was one of those people. I was at law schools, multiple different law schools, reading about my law school. You know, humorously, every once in a while, I would see my name come up like, Dean Spivey. I love that guy, but man, he needs some ADD medication. That was one of them. (laughs) Right. But, you know, you're reading about your school. And as I was reading these threads, I just was every year on it, I was getting more and more perturbed by the adherence to really bad advice. This podcast is not going to be me naming a thousand pieces of bad advice I've read over the years. It would be impossible. I couldn't even do that in a week on Reddit. There's just too much. This podcast is going to be more for the sources and the directions and how to detect bad advice. But let me give you the, the, the most damaging one that came up for many years. It was, you should only take the LSAT once. And this was a huge deal like eight or nine years ago. Pre-law advisors were saying it. The vast majority of law school applicants were saying it. And they were saying it because around 2006, 2007, 2008, sure enough, every LSAT score that you sent to a law school got reported to US News and World Report. So way back in the day, If you took the LSAT and got a 165 and then retook it and got a 160, that would really hurt you. But around 2008, U.S. News and World Report stopped asking for all scores. They only started collecting the high score. So the entire scenario changed. If you're a dean of admission and you're only reporting the high score for reporting purposes, I promise you, and we have blogged extensively on this, the score that you are, your eyes are glued to is that high score. So, you know, a 178 and a 160 does not compute into the divisible number between those two. You are looking at that 178 for both admission and scholarship purposes. And here's my sort of general point, Anna. I saw years worth of applicants getting such bad advice that, you know, they're saying, hey, I'm retaking. I'm doing well on my, on my practice. I'm retaking. They were talked out of retaking. And just two or three points higher would have given them, you know, $100,000 more at the school they were already admitted at and a bunch more admits. And I saw this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, millions of dollars worth of bad advice on that one topic alone. Again, I mentioned that this podcast isn't really for me naming every piece of bad advice, but I did something interesting when you and I were setting up. I Googled Spivey Consulting Myths, and then I Googled Spivey Consulting Mistakes. The very first blogs I ever wrote when I founded this firm nine years ago were the top 10 mistakes that I kept seeing people make online. Mm. And yeah, and then if you Google just Spivey Consulting Mistakes, you'll see like we have, I didn't even realize this. I guess we're just always aggravated at bad advice (laughs) because we have... (laughs) Tons of blogs on like top 10 grammar mistakes, top 10 personal statements mistakes, top 10 reasons you're annoying admissions people. So, you know, as a follow up to this podcast, since I'm going to try not to, you know, just name specific after specific, that's a Google search away. Yeah, definitely. The, the, the retaking one is so, so interesting because now I feel like 
applicants who are online on these message boards can almost not even imagine a world where the dominant online advice is that you shouldn't retake the LSAT because it's such a mantra, retake the LSAT, retake and reapply, retake, retake. But I, I know that I still get emails from folks who maybe are less engaged online, who haven't checked out the message boards, who still ask, you know, I've taken the LSAT once, should I retake it again? I think I can do better. And the answer is, of course, but because they might still have sort of these remnants of that old bad advice, people are still questioning whether they should retake the LSAT, even though they know they can do better because of that old advice. I lived that life and it wasn't like a binary overnight change, but like, so 10 years ago, 90% of people on message boards would advise never taking the LSAT more than once. And we would go in there and we would say, you know, that, that that's actually outdated advice. I, we, we know it still exists on some websites because they haven't updated their websites, but that's outdated advice. Schools don't submit anything but the high score now to U.S. News and World Report. And then it, went, it wasn't like from 90% to 10%, you know, it was a slow. And I can remember the last time someone aggressively fought back. This is like three years ago, but they were like, but on NYU's website, they say they average. And, and I'm going to listen to them, not you. So even like three years ago, there was like this like angry pushback, but you don't really see that anymore. I think you're right. You either see people that are just brand new to the process and, and understandably don't know, or you see people who are really entrenched in the process as applicants, and they absolutely know to retake. So you mentioned the the different sources of bad advice and how the, the bad advice that you see online comes from a variety of different sources. Can you talk a little bit more about that, about what those sources are? Yeah, let me just let me just list them so I don't forget them on them, and then we'll dissect each one. So the sources would be admitted students slash current law students. By the way, let me, before I just rattle off these sources, let me just claim that I don't mean every single one in any of these categories, but some subset of these categories, some subset of admitted students and or current law students, some set of applicants, some subset of pre-law advisors, some subset of people who charge money for admissions advice. I'm going to tell you a crazy story about that. Some set of law schools. I'll tell you another crazy story about that and uh, lawyers and faculty members. So those are sort of, I mean, you hear admissions advice, literally, obviously, from all those different groups. Let me just dissect each one now. I started with admitted students. So someone comes online, and this is like with the best intentions, I think, often. They say, hey, I was just admitted to Yale, or hey, I'm a 1L at Harvard. And I want you to know I wrote a two-page personal statement about why I wanted to go to Harvard, you know, and about how my entire life, for me, it was Harvard or no one. And lo and behold, Harvard admitted me. So everyone, all you people applying to Harvard, know that that's the, that's the secret sauce right there. That's the secret ingredient. Well, maybe, probably not. General terms, I would not encourage an applicant to write their personal statement two pages on why they want to go to a specific law school. So probably not, but also probably... What that person isn't telling you is that their family immigrated from Sudan during a war-torn period of the country, and they left all their belongings behind, and that was their diversity statement. And by the way, they have a 177 and a 3.9. <laughs> right. So they probably got into Harvard in spite of that personal statement and not because of it. It's a perfect way to word it. And I would take what you just said, on a. if I was listening to this podcast, the more someone says something with conviction online – oh, absolutely, you should do this, the more I would actually question, there's, there's that, do you remember that family guy movie they made about us, about, about you and me, Anna? Like that kind of funny <laughs> spoof? Yeah, yeah, the, the parody. <laughs> yeah, that was great because it, was t- it talked about how subjective the admissions process is. I can probably find that and link that. Please do. Please do. Also, I want to show my friends again. So... <laughs> You know, admissions is subjective. And when people talk in absolute terms, that's when we key in that that person might be giving bad advice. And so let me get to the second subset, which is current applicants. I'll see multiple times a year a current applicant speaking in an absolute. When they're talking like that, what you often reverse engineer is they're actually intentionally giving bad advice to mess with the other applicants because they are rightfully looking at admissions, I hate to say it like this, but admissions is a competition. You're competing against all other applicants to the schools you're applying to. And what if what a small group of people do every year 
is they give wrongful advice because they know that some people will embrace it. Advice online about admissions, I see this, I, every once in a while I'll pop into the undergrad admission board applying to colleges, and I'll see people just clinging to the worst advice. And the reason why they do that is because they are very aspirational and it's, and it's very important to them. So if someone says something with conviction about admission or about the admissions process, you see a lot of people just clinging to that conviction. So someone will say, the classic example, Anna, you'll remember this, and I think maybe some people listening to this podcast will remember it. But do you remember last cycle, someone said something along the lines of, you might remember better than I, but hey, I'm a, I can't name who I am or what school I'm from, but I'm a T10 dean of admission, ask me anything. Yep, I remember. Right. So before there was a single question, I was like, I'm highly skeptical. Because yep. to begin with, if, you, if most law schools don't do that, number two, if you were going to do that, you would probably do it in part for marketing reasons. So you would say, hey, I'm so-and-so at Princeton Law School. And I can only speak for Princeton, but ask me anything. Because you wouldn't have the time to just do it anonymously. So we were skeptical. And then within like the first two answers, you could tell that the person claiming to be this anonymous dean of admissions, like, do you remember the emails within our firm bouncing back? We could tell immediately because they weren't using admissions vernacular. They're speaking in, in terms of admissions professionals would never use. Right. Here's the sad thing. And, and actually, if, so, if anyone is listening to this podcast and they ask, a question in that thread last year. I feel really bad because that thread lasted like, I don't know, 180 to 210 questions long. So people, again, with strong feelings about convictions about, hey, this person can help me. We're asking these highly sophisticated, nuanced questions and getting made up answers in response. And then finally, the thread got taken down. But think about how much false hope or bad advice that was given in that false thread before it got taken down. So another source is just current applicants, maybe current applicants trying to give good advice, but they just happen to be wrong. And then maybe those with bad intentions as well. And maybe bad intentions. And I should also add that the flip side of this, and we hired one of them, user of the boringest, every year there are some applicants, I mean, he's a law school student now, but he was an applicant when we hired him. Every once in a while, there are some applicants that seem to really instinctively get admissions so there are people out there giving wonderful advice. My point is, if you haven't done admissions, it's actually hard to discern who's giving the good advice and who's giving the bad advice. The next group was pre-law advisors. So this is, a, I mean, this is a tricky one because there are some exceptional and professional, consummate professional pre-law advisors out there. We've hired two of them. Greg Schaefer, who had made admissions decisions for, I believe, undergrad or red files, and had, you know, for 20 years, sent his students at Maryland to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, etc. And then we just hired Roddy Vance, who's done this as long as anyone at our firm. And, you know, just the most impeccable reputation. Again, sent people to Harvard, Stanford, Yale. But there's a lot of turnover in pre-law advising. There's a lot of, let me put it another way, there's a lot of new pre-law advisors. And then there's just some pre-law advisors who have zero admissions experience. They're a political science faculty member. Some vice provost says, hey, you're going to be the pre-law advisor this year. And that person knows, you know, nothing about pre-law advising. They're a faculty member. So one of the things we often see coming from pre-law advisors, particularly when they're faculty members, is they'll say something like, oh, well, you have a 177 in a 39 but no one from our school has ever gone to Harvard before, so I wouldn't apply there. You don't have a shot. And I particularly mentioned the faculty thing because there's a few pieces of bad advice that we hear every year from faculty. That's one of them. And the other one is similarly related. It's, okay, you should go to the absolute highest ranked school possible. So if you get into the 12th ranked school with no money, and if you get into the 13th ranked school with a full ride, you have to go to that 12th ranked school. The reason why we hear this from faculty is because, understandably so, for that very small subset of population, if you want to go to law school and be a faculty member, rankings matter a ton. So that's why you sort of, you know, you hear the, these repeats of sort of almost elitism from some faculty pre-law advisors, because that's how you become a faculty member is by going to a really good school. So another one that someone at our firm mentioned to me that they see a bunch from pre-law advisors is someone will ha have like a substance abuse background, you know, or a mental health background. And the pre-law advisor will say, abjectly, 
you can't write about that. Well, in many cases, overcoming a challenge is the absolute best thing you can write about. The devil's in the detail. Again, though, the warning sign there was you can't write about that. There's someone using an absolute. I had a client before I think I knew you, Anna. I think it was year one of this firm. And this Mm. client is at a big law firm now in New York City. Ended up at a top, I'll just say top 10, but it was ranked higher than top 10. I'm trying my hardest not to out anyone in this process. (laughs) Ended up at a top 10 law school with seven drug convictions on their record. Hmm. So what do you think we wrote about? Intentionally so, he crafted a personal statement that I helped him strategize about, about overcoming the substance abuse. There is no way that applicant would have been admitted to this very elite law school if they hadn't talked about their substance abuse and how they had been sober for, you know, I can remember the wording we use. I haven't had a single intoxicant, including caffeine, in over eight years or something like that. Hmm. Right. So, you know, the school can see the seven drug conviction, which is going to bring me to the next topic, which is lawyers giving advice. The school can see that. So we needed to address that. And it was a wonderful personal statement because this guy had totally changed the direction of his life. And those are great personal statements. Right. Whereas in another scenario, it very well might have made no sense at all to talk about a particular substance use issue or something else, depending on the circumstances, but it's just not that one size fits all. Like you know, said. I actually, I, I have one that comes to mind that someone who I talked to on the phone who got admitted with a 180 and a horrible GPA, and he wasn't a client. We just had a, a free phone call, and he confided in me that his GPA was really bad because he, he had, had suffered from lots of alcohol problems as an undergrad. But he was married with a family and a wonderful LSAT. And, you know, I was like, you know, you're, you're married with a family and there's nothing on your record in the past. You don't have a DUI. You just happened to confide in me that you were in your dorm drinking and playing video games 24-7. I certainly wouldn't write a personal statement about drinking and playing video games 24-7. I, I Mike Spivey, personally wouldn't mind reading a personal statement about someone playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's parts of the story you, you can exclude for sure. So, again, the Family Guy video we're going to link. Subjectivity matters. So speaking of convictions and things, so, so people get advice from lawyers all the time, and lawyers tend to give, like, two forms of bad advice. One is take the top three things from your resume and write a third of your personal statement about the most impressive thing, the next third about the second most impressive job, and then, you know, the third third about the third most impressive job. And that would make for, like, the worst personal statement. I would hate to read that. Maybe, you know, in four out of 10 cases, again, not absolutes, you had a really cool job. The one I always remember is the person who worked for NFL Films because she knew nothing about the NFL or nothing about documentary. She just had a sort of a a rare job. I don't want to say unique. Other people have obviously worked for NFL Films. Here's a pet peeve of mine in missions when people use the word unique, but it's not unique. So if she had said, I had a unique job, I worked for NFL Films, that's a, that's a lie. But she had a very differentiated, rare job. So she was in that 40% that, yeah, they could take the first line of their resume and turn it into a great personal statement. But when someone says, take your best bullet points from your resume and make them a personal statement topic, that is really bad advice. The other thing that lawyers tend to say, because they tend to err on the lawyerly side of worst case scenarioing, but we hear quite often lawyers who talk to our clients with character and fitness issues say, oh, well, if it's not on your record, if it was expunged, don't bring it up in the application. Well, that is really dangerous advice. This is on a generally, I think you know this, this is generally like based on state law. You know, if the school is in Massachusetts, they can't say, tell us everything that's ever happened to you. They have to say, tell us what you've been convicted for or something like that. California too. But if if you're in a different state, depending on the state, you can say, please tell us every criminal violation you've had, including those that were expunged. So if a lawyer says, well, don't tell them that, don't tell them the expunged ones, And so you merrily go along your way and you fill it out and you follow that advice. And three years later, the American Bar comes knocking with their character and fitness assessment to sit for the bar. And they find out, because they look at your applications, at least they can. It's not not a FERPA violation for them to go in and look through your applications. Another classic example is the FBI. I can remember when I was in admissions, every year, FBI agents walking in and pulling our files. 
If your answer doesn't align with the question asked, can you imagine going to law school for three years, going into $200,000 debt, dreaming of working for the FBI or just going to a law firm, but you can't sit for the bar or you can't be hired because you misrepresented yourself in the application? So that covers that one. I'm going to tell a story about law schools, but I'm going to, in this story, let me just revisit pre-law advisors because I think people on Reddit are going to get a kick out of a true statement I'm going to make. Okay. You know, if you're going to turn to anyone for admissions advice, I would recommend you turn to a law school because a law school admissions officer is going to know why they like things and why they don't like things. I know Dean Z at Michigan well, and I know she does videos now starting this year. And because I know her and I know her sense of moral principles in her code of conduct, I would imagine, I haven't seen them, I haven't had time to see them, but I imagine her videos are spot on. But because Dean Z is so transparent, I also imagine she'd be the first person that would say, yes, but I mean, there are some things I just can't talk about in my videos. Because I was in emissions and there were, I can remember there were many things I couldn't talk about. So I gave you the best case But let me tell you the worst case. So every year there's these conferences where you have like 50 admissions professionals and like 200 or 300 or 400 pre-law advisors. And they're kind of on paper win-wins because the pre-law advisors, many of whom, as we've addressed, are brand new. So you can overhear them talking at tables and you'll hear them saying, I don't think law schools give merit scholarships. Is that right? No, geez. Yeah, that's real. I've literally heard that. I'm not, I'm not normatively faulting the brand new pre-law advisor. I'm just saying that they're brand new. The funny true statement I wanted to make is if you were to take 200 brand new pre-law advisors, I would much rather, if I, if I were any one of their bosses, fill their job with your typical everyday Reddit law school admissions poster. <laughs> you know, the, the person that's been on Reddit law school admissions for six months It's going to know orders of magnitude more about admissions than someone that was just hired to be a pre-law advisor because they were the pre-med advisor for three years at the university and the university decided they needed a pre-law advisor. That's just a factual statement. So going back to law schools being great sources for some, but also not always great sources, let me tell you this one story. I'm not going to out anyone. So maybe when I retire, on a, I'll write a tell-all book. Man, that book would be crazy. I'm not going to out anyone, but I'm at this conference, and I'm with one of my business partners. And there's a dean of admissions at a very highly regarded school. And this person is doing the presentation. And a pre-law advisor, who I'm going to assume was new to their role, asked the following question. They say, would you rather admit someone with a 2.9 from a really rigorous, you know, science, math background? And by the way, in admissions, we call this high consensus fields. So high consensus means in math, like two plus two is always four. That sounds very easy, but the high consensus fields, organic chemistry, physics, math, engineering, those are where you see the lowest grades because the tests, you can get 60% wrong. They're binary answers. I was a philosophy major. You didn't get 60% of your essay wrong. <laughs> right? That is very true. Actually, I think I, I think I did skirt that once. I have a funny story where there's <laughs> the professor was known for, he would tell you the six questions that were going to be on the final exam, but it was only going to be one question, one of okay. six. And then he would roll a die twice. If he rolled a four or a six, you could either answer number four or number six. So like half of us in the class would just learn the answers for the first five questions, and we would we would never focus on question number six because if this guy was going to roll the die twice, it's impossible for you know he would never right right, right. right. <laughs> well th- this is a real story by the way I'm not making this up he happened that year to just roll the die once and he rolled a six the one question I hadn't studied for oh no so my friends and I for the rest of my college existence we called bad luck rolling a six. <laughs> So I guess it is possible to get like 80% of a philosophy exam wrong. So unless unless you're Mike Spidey. Unless you're me in 1992 (laughs) or something like that. Getting back to this, the question that was asked is, would you be more likely to admit someone with a 2.9 in a really tough academic rigorous transcript or a 4.0 from like political science? This person who I promise you, Anna Hicks, I say your name to even add more gravitas to my... (laughs) This person who knows better stood up in front of 250 or 300 pre-law advisors, many of whom are taking notes and they're new and they're sucking up this information, said, I would always admit there's that absolute again. 
I would always admit that low GPA, tough academic background transcript over the 4.0. Mm. And, I, you know, I look at my business partner and he looks at me and there's just like, you know, our eyes just told the whole story. Like that guy just told a flat out lie. And then I scan the room and you see like a lot of pe- happy people in the audience because that was the happy answer they wanted to hear. My point is this. If you're going to go to anyone for advice, law schools are great sources to go to. But think about that one story. In that one statement, this person created a cyclone of bad advice. Because it wasn't just this dean of admission that said it. It was now 200 pre-law advisors or 150 or however many were nodding their head in agreement going on and saying that to all their students. And then their students post online. Oh, well, my pre-law advisor said they heard the dean of admission at this school say. So this is how these mythologies get started. And it was spoken as an absolute. So that was a that was a key trigger point. Did I cover them all? I'm glad to have just besmirched the entire subset of the world that gives law school admissions advice. You know, we missed one. We missed okay. um, people who give advice for money. Ah, that's an important one. So, you know, the, the, incidentally, that's, we do that. We're a firm. We, you know, we f- feed our families through giving intellectual property that we have, which is all of our, I think, how many years experience do we have as a firm? We are well above 200 years of experience working in law school admissions offices, making decisions on files now. Okay, so we fall in this subset, but we try, I mean, one of our three core principles is just, try to always give the best possible advice as transparently as, as possible. But let me give you the other extreme of that. This is like maybe five or six years ago, and I get a Facebook message from someone who, I, I, I don't know if I knew this person or not. They knew me, and I think they had exchanged like messages on a message board with me before. And it said, hey, Spivey, I just want, I'm going to link a video to you because this guy just set up a, a business page on Facebook, and he has a video and I, he's like, I think you're going to be appalled. So that word appalled, you know, triggered me to actually read the message and click on the link. And sure enough, this guy had set up a company, a law school admissions consulting company. And there's this video of him t- saying, and, and it's so, this is just like, it just reminds me of these like 1 a.m. marketing infomercials where the person's like, I'm going to make you a million dollars. This is how I did it. <laughs> this guy had that same cheesy look to him. Honestly, if I remembered his name, I would say it because this guy committed fraud. So he's on this video. He's saying, hey, I'm a former dean of admissions at a law school, and I'm going to tell you the big secret of law school admission. 80% of admission is personal statements, and you're all doing them wrong. That is like snake oil sales pitch 101. But again, I guarantee if that video had sat there long enough, a lot of people would have been like, oh, man, this, is, this process is really important to me. And this guy is sitting here with a tie on saying, I'm a former dean of admission. 80% of admissions process is the personal statement and you're all doing them wrong. This is how snake oil or whatever over history has been sold. You know, I had this water with this mineral in it and it's going to cure your cancer. People want to believe that. In this case, I had this magical formula for your personal statement. You're all doing them wrong. So let me tell you what the formula is. So I watched this ridiculous video and I'm getting like more and more angry. I think I actually, Anna, I think I got up and started pacing around. Like that's how annoyed I was because like everything is off. Like the advice is off. The claim that admissions is 80% personal statement is way off. It's like 20% personal statement. So we, and I don't think you were with the firm at the time, were you? I, you know, I actually was now that you're describing it. I think I actually have an archived copy of his video that I saved in case you wanted to back up the fact that he had said these things because you literally, you wanted to preserve it because it was so absurd, the advice that he was giving for posterity. Okay. Well, that's one of the 10,000 reasons I hired you is because you keep things like this. (laughs) I'm in a good mood. So please don't send me that video. I will not. Okay. If that guy ever pops back up, so so we did a little research. He had never been a, a law school dean of admission. So he's essentially committing fraud. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I posted on his Facebook business wall a comment, which was, you know, this is fraud. This is all wrong. And then like two days later, everything was deleted and taken down. So, you know, there are people out there who will give wonderful admissions advice 
But there are people out there who will, you know, at the far end of the extreme, just misrepresent everything just to sell you a product. So, you know, again, I guess the overall theme being like, you know, triangulate your sources. If one source is saying, here's the magical formula, try to triangulate before you listen to just that source. If that source is your pre-law advisor or someone that got admitted to Yale Law School or even a law school. Yeah, just it's always good to triangulate. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I remember reading an article with quotes from a consultant where the consultant was saying something about how your first sentence really needs to draw the reader in and, you know, all of that, which, you know, fine, that's all well and good. And they use the example of this great first line as I've always been interested in international finance. And I remember that was just a funny example because it's not, you know, the catastrophic advice that some people give, but it's just such a, such an easy, small example of this is not, this is clearly not great advice. Yeah. If if you're, I mean, what most applicants don't realize is the typical admissions file reader that's what we called ourselves on admissions, is reading like 60 of these a day. So if you have just read 45 personal statements, and this is your 46, and that's the opening line, and college football is on in the background or whatever, there's a strong chance you might tune that person out really quickly. What we try to do as a firm is we try to have every word in the application, ideally, a tune-in kind of word. And that opening sentence is a tune-out kind of word. Did you know, so you sent me on it, you sent me that, that article and I emailed U.S. News and World Report and said, you know, this is like not good advice. <laughs> <laughs> and they responded. They said, yeah, it was an old article, you know, and they they did draw attention to, to that fact. We have a funny relationship with U.S. News and World Report because I respect their general counsel very well. As you know, I have to speak to the general counsel every year because every year various people give us the U.S. News World Report rankings early. Various People get them early and they give them to us early. And then I have to make a strategic decision. Do I publish these rankings online early or not? Constitutionally, the Supreme Court says I do have the right to publish them. My friend at U.S. News and World Report, who I have very good conversations with, tells me that (laughs) his opinion on that is different than than what all the constitutional lawyers and deans of law schools and so forth say online about (laughs) journalistic integrity. So yeah, that's a great example of bad advice that was said with lots of conviction. Right. The the other thing you were bringing up about, you were talking about the consultant who was saying that the personal statement is 80% of the admissions process, which, you know, to you and I is quite obviously a huge understatement of the importance of numbers in the process. I mean, is the LSAT and GPA only 20% under this, I suppose? But another brand of bad advice that I think we both see a lot online is sort of overstating the importance of numbers. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can. Um, You called that person a consultant. I'm going to call them a criminal. Fair. But yeah, your personal statement is not 80% of the process. if, If anything, the way I would word it is this. To begin with, admissions is about a singular word. And that word is differentiation. That's not obvious if you haven't done admissions, but when you do admissions, you see thousands of files a year and you admit, you know, 100 or 200, 300 out of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And you admit those three or 400 because they differentiate. The easiest way to differentiate is empirically, right? With a 4.2 or a 180, that by very definition, a 180 is differentiating because it's, it's I mean, to, you know, it's in the, what, the 99.99 percentile, right? I don't know, like 20 to 50 people get a 180 every year out of about 60,000, roughly. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a tiny, tiny it's a tiny, percentage. Right, right. So by, by very definition, that differentiates. Absolutely. So, so numbers differentiate. And the second part is they go into U.S. News and World Report ranking. U.S. News and World Report doesn't rank your law school by the loveliness of the 250 personal statements that matriculated to your school. So numbers matter. Here's another great takeaway, I hope, from this podcast. If anyone says that you have a 20% chance at Harvard based on your numbers, but they can turn that into a 70% chance, and your numbers are like a 155 and a 39 or a 155 and a 32, they're lying. They're lying because numbers do matter. But the other thing we see a lot is we see a couple posts every year that say schools only care about your numbers. Only numbers matter. 
I can understand why someone would post this. Is you know someone gets denied and they're in a bad mood, and they go in and they post only numbers matter, and then a lot of people who have been denied because most people, most applicants are denied at some school, and they're understandably aggravated. If there's one thing I can tell you from 20 plus years, 21 plus years of doing this, admissions process can create some wonderful days and some bad days. And on those bad days, it's very fair that someone would go in and post schools only care about your numbers. But that's a factually incorrect statement, and I can prove it in two ways. To begin with, there are schools every year that will have people with the exact same numbers that are denied, waitlisted, and admitted. And we see it every year. So if schools only cared about numbers, you wouldn't see that sort of scatter plot. You would, you would see all admit or all deny right. Right. or all weightless admit or all weightless deny. The second thing that's, you know, these, these outliers are always interesting to us and we wish we could, you know, find them and, and talk to them. Sometimes we do because they apply the next cycle is every year you see people with like a 177, 178, 179, 3.8, 3.9 who are denied by a few schools and the ones that are the most interesting to me are the ones who reapply and find us and they don't have character and fitness issues that cause them to be denied. Mm. They so just had to find out what is it in that application. I love it. I mean, this is like, yeah. this is like, you know, me getting a toy under a Christmas tree. I, <laughs> I, I guess that sounds so impolite because we're talking about someone's denial, but there's a happy side to that too. We can reverse engineer why they were denied usually really quickly and then help them get better outcomes and help them not step on all those landmines that they stepped on. Right. So if numbers only mattered, neither of those two scenarios would, would exist. In fact, you could, you're, if you were a law school, you could save hundreds of thousands of dollars in salary by just, you know, having one admission person do marketing and then have a computer spit out admit waitlist deny decisions based on numbers. So much of your time in admission during I don't know October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, which is most months, <laughs> is spent <laughs> reading applications. It takes a freaking long time to read an application if if you're committed to your job, because each application is what 12, 15 pages long. There's probably at least three pages of writing in there, maybe more. More and more schools interview. So a lot of your time and admissions is dedicated to reading an application. You could just, I mean, if you could just put that into an algorithm and into a computer, it would just, you know, that did it instantly, that would be great for law schools, but they can't because they have to read the substantive, subjective quality of every application. Again, that Family Guy video. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, talk, talking about numbers and the degree to which numbers can accurately or not accurately predict the outcomes that a given applicant actually is going to receive, that that actually brings up sort of another point, which is sort of these prediction websites where you, an applicant can go in and enter their LSAT score, their GPA, and predict sort of a percentage outcome of, oh, there's like an 80% chance I will get into Harvard or whatever law school. And I also know that you do not like these websites. Um, can you Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So every year someone says to me, hey, Spivey, why don't you do one of those? You know, you could do it with real data, not self-inputted data. Because like on my LSN or whatever, it's, it's, it's applicants that are putting their own data. Right. And you're more likely to put that you were admitted somewhere and you're excited than you are to go in and fill out all your rejections. So there's already some, some bias there. There's bias there. There's also a few people that are going to try to mess with people's minds. So they're going to say that they were you know, denied at Harvard with a 177. They're just trying to get in the heads of the people. You know, there are some people who will always think of this process as competition. And they will do everything they can to gain a competitive advantage. So there's some people that will just put false numbers on there. So yeah, we could we as a firm could do this with our applicant with our client pool, and the data would be real, but it still would be you know horribly skewed data. Let me give you a better example. At forty eight years old, I now read actuarial tables. When I was your age, I did not because like I can look at an actuarial table and you know say my life expectancy is seventy eight years, and I'll say okay, I'm forty eight, I got thirty more left. <laughs> Right, So I'm going to maximize and I'm going to optimize these next 30 years. And I think the older people, no one listening to this podcast is going to be able to relate, but when you hit like 45, <laughs> you can start relating. This is like best case scenario data in the sense that it's accurate. There are death certificates with ages for everyone who dies. 
So this is massive amounts of data that's all accurate. But am I going to die the day I turn 78? Of course not. I mean, I, I guess I might. But the odds are astronomically small that that's going to happen. They're just average data. So similarly, even in a best case scenario, if LSAC and ETS, who does the GRE, were to combine all their data, which incidentally would be collusion, I think. You might know more than I do about that. I do not. But here, I'll, I, since, since our audience is soon to be lawyers, I'll tell you my funny collusion story. I was interviewed, I think it was maybe by Above the Law or someone. I did an article with someone about how the majority of universities were going to be open in the fall, despite the COVID pandemic. And then four days later, like 113, do you know, do you know this story, Anna? 113 colleges like announced that they were going to be like on campus with room and board. So the next day I'm on LinkedIn and I'm like, why are there five DOJ people looking at my LinkedIn profile? And then sure enough, the next day, not, a, not the DOJ, but an antitrust lawyer at a big firm. I spent an hour on the phone with this person because I knew someone else at the firm and I respected the firm. And everyone was curious how four days before 113 schools announced they were going to be open room and board, how I did this mysterious article that, you know, that, so this is what the antitrust lawyer told me. It's really, this is really fascinating. He said, big pharma has like a year pass because of COVID. And so the microscope is off them, but there's still the same number of people looking for antitrust violations. So they're looking at different places and higher education is one of the places that's under scrutiny. So it makes sense that five people were looking at my LinkedIn profile because was there some like online Zoom agreement amongst colleges that they would all be open. That would be collusion. Particularly if they all said, okay, we're going to hold tuition steady. But the hilarious answer is twofold. To begin with, I did that thing because I had just read that Brown president's, I think her name is President Paxson. I just read her article and I, I've done this long enough to know that when a luminary leader of an institution says something in a very encouraging, optimistic way, others are going to follow suit. But the bigger piece of the puzzle is this. Seat deposit deadlines were coming up. And schools wanted matriculants. So there really was a deadline. It wasn't an agreed upon deadline. It was just a deadline when a bunch of schools had, had seat deposit deadlines coming up. It, yep, that, that makes sense. Where in the world, what was the question that had me go off on this long? <laughs> so we were actually talking about prediction sites. And then you were talking about ETS and LSAC. Okay, so right, right, and right, put together you. their data. This is why, this is, again, one of the 10,000 reasons you work for this firm. I, I would have had to just end <laughs> the podcast. <laughs> In an ideal scenario, even if they could take all the data and come up with a prediction model, you know, you enter your numbers and it gives you a percent chance, it's still highly flawed because it doesn't address that 20% of the thousands of things you can do, some of which are feathers on the scale. I'll give you an example of a feather on the scale. Putting your cell phone number at the end of your email signature block, that probably gets like three people admitted a year or more. Because you email a school and you say, hey, you know, it's late in the cycle. I just want you to know I would, matri I would you know, matriculate immediately. And that person just had two people drop off and they, they want to gauge your interest. They don't even have to pull up your file. They can just mash their cell phone that mashes your button. They can call you and they can gauge your interest on the spot. You save them having to log into a system. Obviously, this is not the, like the sine qua non way to get into law school. It's a tiny little thing, but there are thousands of little things you can do to get yourself admitted that aren't captured in any data. And there's thousands of things that you can do as an individual to get you denied that aren't captured in any data. Plus, any data we have is about the past, right? It's not predictive of the future, which is this present cycle, it's past data. What's that quote that I read once that I was quoting for like three weeks straight that I think everyone oh, at the firm yeah, was, yeah. All of, um, no amount of sophistication will lay the fact that all of your knowledge is about the past and all of your decisions is about the future. I, I must have really said that quote to an obnoxious level to still be able to remember it. But that's, <laughs> that's very applicable to this. Those predicting sites, it's like 5% of the applicant pool it's a biased 
you know, the applicant who gets into Stanford happily is going to immediately go in there and put that in. But then if, you know, three weeks later, Columbia denies them, there's no incentive for them to go in and update their profile. They're going to Stanford. So, yeah, I'm not a fan. We, we could add one within a week's time. You would be working long hours on it. I apologize, but we're never going to do it. <laughs> well, you know what? I hate absolutes, so maybe we'll do it. But I can't imagine at this current state a scenario where we would do one of those predicting things. I, I mean, I don't know. You, you have thoughts in it. Well, I mean, I think that these predictive sites can be helpful to a certain extent if they are taken for what they are, which is understanding that it is that small sector data and that it is biased and that it's not complete and that it's about the past. But I think it could be helpful, especially for folks who are brand new to the admissions process, especially if they've gotten, you know, advice like we were talking about before from a pre-law advisor. You know, maybe they have a 172 LSAT and a 3.9, but their 3.9 is from a small state school. So they're wondering, you know, do I even have a shot at big national schools with a national reputation? That person can put those numbers into these prediction sites and get a lot of value out of them, frankly, when they see, hey, a lot of people with my numbers, even though, you know, they didn't go to Princeton or they didn't go to Yale for undergrad, are getting into these top schools. I think that that can be really helpful. I think it becomes when you overanalyze them, put too much stock in them, and really take that as, okay, I have a 75% shot at X school. That's when it becomes problematic and difficult, in in my opinion. Yeah, perfectly said. If you're new to the process, it's good to get a general feel of where you may rest at any given year. But beyond that very generalizable, all right, these are my bookends. You know, maybe I'm very unrealistic at Harvard and maybe I'm very realistic at this other school. And those are my two bookends and I should apply to schools in between those numbers for sure. I worry so much when people post online the predictor said I'm, I only have an 11% chance at Harvard, or it says I have an 89% chance at Harvard. It, it knows nothing about you. We'll put bad advice to rest. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're pretty much done talking about the, the bad advice that we were hoping to talk about. I do know, Mike, that you and I were talking about LinkedIn the other day and that you had something you were, were hoping to talk about, about LinkedIn. So if we're done with the bad advice, do you want to talk about that? The, what made me think of LinkedIn is you and I were talking about LinkedIn the other day. Maybe five DOJ people had <laughs> my <laughs> LinkedIn thing. I don't know. I can't remember why we're talking about it. But it, it, this is totally non sequitur to the general theme of the podcast, but there are ways to use LinkedIn and ways not to. So let me just very briefly, and then we'll, then we'll call it a day. What's the best way to use LinkedIn? It would be to connect with a student at a law school to ask them about their experience. Because the best advice is not going to come from admissions, you know, or the admitted virtual admitted students program where they parade the happiest students out there. The best advice would be to ask someone who's at that law school. So that would be a great way to use LinkedIn. And oftentimes, I have found to my pleasant surprise, so many law school students will stop what they're doing and give 10 to 15 minutes of, yeah, this is what I like about my school and this is what I don't like about my school. Now, obviously, don't if you, if you email one person at a school and they don't respond, don't hold it against them. They're probably reading 600 pages of con law. Maybe cast a, a wide net and don't like crush people with, it's been three days and I haven't heard from you. I'm still curious if I should go to your school. And you can, and people can, so I'm, you know, I'm Mike Spivey on LinkedIn. And anyone who wants can send me a LinkedIn, whatever they call it on that thing. And I accept them all. I just don't have time to respond to the direct messages. And we post, you know, we try to post things there. So the more sophisticated question would be, what about law school admissions people? I would say it like this. If you meet virtually or, you know, much more rare today, but in real life, if you meet a dean of admission, an admission officer, and you, you know, have a conversation with them, you are more than welcome to send them a whatever it's called, connection request. I would never direct message a dean of admission. The reason why I'm okay with people sending them a connecting request is it's another data point to that person that you're very interested in their school and you had a good conversation and you want them to remember their name. But just sit on that. And if it's a blind stranger, if you're just sending the the poor dean of admissions at every law school friend request or whatever on LinkedIn and you never met them, that's a mistake for sure. You know, they're probably not going to respond, but they might remember your name in a negative way. 
So if you met them, you know, connect with them. And who knows? Maybe they'll hire you six years later to be their assistant director of admission. I'm sure that, you know, crazier stories have happened than that. But the real target audience for LinkedIn would be current students or maybe even faculty. Again, please don't spam faculty, but maybe even faculty at schools. That's sort of a way of getting a 360 degree sort of evaluation of that school. All right, great. Well, thank you for that bonus advice on top of our, our bad advice podcast. Is there anything else that you would like to, to add before we, we close? This was one of our longest. I enjoyed it. So thank, thanks, Sana, for the time. And we'll try yeah, to get this up Mike. as soon as possible. 